Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll visit with world-renowned concert pianist Long Long, a classical virtuoso with rock star appeal. And we'll talk with award-winning composer and conductor Eric Whitaker. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight we talk to two major figures in the world of classical music. Concert pianist Long Long has been called the hottest artist on the classical music planet by the New York Times. I recently talked to Long Long about his music. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ted. I mean, you are you are a big deal on the classical music. Before we get to all that business, though, you've been to Arizona before? Yes, it's actually my sixth time in uh, Phoenix. Sixth time? What do you yeah. think? It's very nice and hot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, have you had a chance to kind of see the scenery? I, I wonder about concert artists and such. Do you just kind of go to a town and stay in the hotel and perform and go back to the hotel? How much do you get around? Um, I remember my first time being here was 2001. Um, and uh, I still remember I came with my father and it was we, we were uh, uh, prepared a Chinese uh, box uh, before the concert. Yes. And we take out from the uh, uh, the freeze, so it's a bit cold. So we put on the street. So five minutes later, we had a very nice dinner. There you go. <laughs> it's the old boiling the egg on right. the uh, frying right. the egg on the sidewalk here. Yeah. I got to ask you before we get to what you're doing now. I want to know about because you you were a, a pro, I mean you were a prodigy. You started very young, but you started. You were inspired by a cartoon, a Tom and Jerry cartoon. Talk yes. to us about that. So I was two years and a half, and uh, my parent bought me a piano, but that's already when I was one year old. Wow. So I was watching uh, one of my favorite uh, cartoons, was, uh, Tom and Jerry. And as you know, there's an episode called uh, uh, The Cast Concerto. Yes. And so Tom, you know, his tuxedo, nice tie, and start playing the piano. And, and that was my first inspiration. I, I look at, you know, there are big, concert grand piano and I look at my little upright piano I thought oh that's that's the father and that's the son yeah, so yeah. I start playing <laughs> that was uh, my first uh, tryout was it was it something how how old were you when you felt the I mean because a, a kid's a kid and an adult kind of feels the music differently but when did you feel that music as part of you I would say uh, when I performed first time uh, I was five years old five years old yeah I played uh, a, a Chopin uh, minute waltz, mm -hmm. uh, and I thought that was such a beautiful uh, music, and also you know the stage light, uh, like now you know yeah, it's sure. very warm, and uh, and also after playing, I got a flower from a little girl. I thought, oh, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Five years old already. <laughs> right. huh? um, when, when, when you were when you start so young, mm -hmm. and you are good so young, and people are watching you, did you feel pressure at all? Um, I mean, I must say. Um, it was not always, you know, uh, very uh, 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 lucky. Uh, when I was seven, I joined a competition, and which I actually I got lost. So I was like not num not even number seven. Wow. So so I got a consolation prize, uh -oh. uh, a little toy. But I think that was actually encouraged me the most from so many years. So so I think sometimes when you are not so good, it actually makes you try to work harder. Interesting, and you did work harder, and yeah. you did obviously move up in terms. It seems as though you connect with the audience in ways that might be a little different than other artists. Talk to. Do you feel it? Do you feel when you're connecting with the audience? Um, I would say no matter whether you are a pop star, whether you're a jazz musician, or you're a classical musician. In the end, we need to get moved by the music, and we need to be totally connected with our heart and our soul to the composition that we are playing. And sometimes I, I felt that you go into a concert, everything was very perfect, but somehow the soul, the heart is not there. Yes. And I, I think it's very important when audience or musicians listen to another performance what they like to hear is your sincere uh, your sincerity and uh, that you know, the f totally concentrated uh, bridge between your heart and to the keyboard. When you have your heart 
and your keyboard mm -hmm. bridged like that, how do you know there's another bridge going out to that audience? How do you know they're with you? I, I actually, you know, the thing is when you start thinking about that, then it's become artificial. Yes. If you're like, hey, look at me, look how <laughs> be, you know, then it's not good. It, it needs to be totally sincere. So, so the thing is when you move by the uh, music yourself, then you have a chance to move to other people. It's interesting you mention that because some critics of your mm -hmm. style say you're too flamboyant, you're too showy. Is, first of all, respond to that. And what is the difference between having a flair and having that connection and being too showy? I mean, there are a lot of uh, different kind of repertoire. I mean, the, uh, the tomorrow we will play a very uh, virtuosic piece, the Prokofiev Third Piano Concerto, and that that is absolutely you know you need to be you know to not show off but to give all your abilities you know to uh, to take it out you know. But sometimes when you play really uh, incredible music by Beethoven, like you know, slow movement adagio, you know, by by Brahms. And that time, everything is becomes the heart and the, the intellectual power rather than you know the, the technique part. So it depends on the pieces. It's almost like a, a, a great actor. You, you need to be capable in uh, um, playing different roles. Do you find yourself, as you age, handling that differently? Are you different now than you were 10 years ago in terms of that, that, that persona on stage? Uh, it's a little bit easier to calm down a bit uh, when you're getting certain uh, uh, level of playing and certain uh, maturity. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the, I mean, the freshness of what you call the instincts shouldn't change because when you, if your instincts changes, then it's not good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you find as you age mm -hmm. that certain pieces of music when you were younger affected you this way? Now they affect you that way? Yeah, for example, you know, the piece I played 10 years ago, even the piece I play tomorrow, mm -hmm. it's a slightly different because after 10 years, you learn a lot of new things and those new ideas gave you another way, another alternative way to play this piece. So it's, it's sometimes it's hard to know which one is better, but certainly it's a, it's a different uh, input. And you don't really care about which one's better per se, you just care about what you're feeling in the moment, correct? I mean, there are certain, uh, you know, a frame of you know, yes. the work you need to follow, you know, the, the, uh, the instruction of the scores, obviously. But after that, you need to free yourself, uh, you know, and to put some, uh, you know, personal ideas uh, on top of the original scores. Um, and, and the interesting is that when you hear the composers playing their hmm. piece, you see a very kind of a interesting input on top of the score. So, yeah. so you know that they, they gave you the room to do it. As yeah. far as getting young people involved in this type of music, mm -hmm. how do you keep their attention? How do you get that spark? Because there's between computers and, and the TV and the smartphones and the this and the that, there's so much going on. So much of it is pop, quick, fast. How do you get them to figure out that that adagio really is something special? Uh, obviously, you don't start with adagio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a great, I mean, great suggestion because uh, today our world becomes so fast and, and so kind of a multiple, what mm -hmm. do you call? But actually, in music, you, you know, when you think about a good performance, it's like a multimedia platform. The only way you know to listen to music is, is the ear, right? But then. You also, you know, when the music comes in to your ear, comes into your brain, it need to be vertical. It cannot be, you know, just kind of flat. Yes. So you need to see the characters, you need to see the messages, you need to see the colors, you need to see the, the uh, structure of the building, and you need to see, the, you know, uh, the, the dynamics. So, so I think everything need to be multiple. So, so in a way that, uh, you know, this time of the year when I'm talking about uh, music to kid, we have, you know, we use smartphones, we use the whatever pad, and uh, we start also physically playing it together, not sure. just talking. You know, because yeah. talking is good, but uh, it's more like a music class. But what we want is to, to get people play together. Oh. That's for kids. Mm. Let's talk about some older kids. Let's talk about adults here who still find classical music intimidating and they don't know what they're missing. It sounds kind of nice, but there are people, they, they, you are putting your heart and soul into that and they're trying to figure out, what am I, what are they missing? What, what, how, do you, how do you tell someone, this is what you need to do to appreciate classical music? 
I think they just need to go to a more concert mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, maybe to see a good concert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's a good yeah. idea. Maybe not try so hard. Yeah, not try, not try too hard, but to you know, maybe go to YouTube. You know, just find some videos of uh, you know great musicians perform. You know, people like Yo Yo Ma, people like Isaac Perlman, people like Pavarotti. You know, and and like Leonard Bernstein. You know, get a maybe shorter clip, and then you know, then I think it's very automatically. You know, and uh, they just feel it, and when you feel it, everything opens. Yes, and sometimes there's some kind of a maybe paper in front of you, but if you kind of pass, you know, if you break through, uh, then everything kind of uh, comes. Then you buy every long, long CD ever made and you can't <laughs> stop playing them. Hey, you played for the opening ceremonies at the Olympics, the, the 08 yes. Olympics there uh, in China. What was that like? It was a, a gigantic stage and I was playing with this little girl who was like five years old at that time and I was like a babysitter and like, you know, please, don't run, you know, there's a lot of people watching you now, you know, just let's play together, you know, having fun. And then after five minutes, I couldn't find her. I was so scared, you know. <laughs> Where did she go? Uh, she, she ran she went away. somewhere. But was, did you, and again, we talked about pressure when you were younger. On a situation like that, you were kind of, you were representing China. And, and in many ways, you do represent China uh, in terms of, of the arts, in terms of the growth of the country, the where the country's future is headed. Do you feel pressure there? Not really. Not I mean, really. I think just do my best, you know, yeah. to, to perform and to be as a good uh, kind of a cultural ambassador. Yeah. yeah. Just so you don't feel like you're necessarily a, a symbol of China's growth and China's uh, changing state uh, image on the stage. I, I'm happy that you know I'm become a, a, a kind of a global citizen, mm -hmm. and then you know, and uh, and, and to, you know to kind of uh, uh, to share, you know, what our generation uh, thinking about uh, toward to the future. And I think it's, and this generation need to be a, a very open generation uh, toward uh, to the global uh, as a one big village. Uh, and I think, you know, and as a musician, that's probably one of the best thing is that we, we are communicators. Yes. And through a piece, you, you don't need to know the culture, but you kind of understood what you were what talking about. What is your, I mean, not necessarily to play, but when you just want to listen to the epitome of classical music, what do you listen to? I actually lo love to listen to Mahler symphonies, and I love to learn, you know, actually I, I love jazz. I, do my, you? Yeah, my favorite artist is Kirby Hancock. And oh, okay. a, but you played uh, with Kirby uh, Hancock, yes, didn't a, you? One of my best friends, and uh, he taught me a lot of uh, great tricks Isn't of, that uh, something? playing jazz. <laughs> Isn't that yeah. something? Well, yeah, the Headhunters is yeah. one of those uh, old uh -huh. uh, albums that just never goes away. Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Good luck with the concert tomorrow, and good to have you back in Arizona. Thank you, Ted. Thank, Thank you. you. Grammy Award-winning composer and conductor Eric Whitaker is best known for his choral work and for incorporating contemporary sounds into his compositions. He's topped the classical music charts and he's also written film scores, musicals, and conducted an online virtual choir project that became an internet sensation. recently spoke with Eric Whitaker about his music and inspiration. That is absolutely gorgeous. Do you, do you, Thank you. Do you. When you listen to that, what, what do you think about? <laughs> I'm, I'm flooded with emotion. You know, first I wrote the piece, yes. and I wrote it 12 years ago, so it's, it's a little bit like looking at a picture of myself from 12 years ago, and it's that personal. And then because it's the virtual choir performing, I still remember seeing every one of the individual faces as their videos were being uploaded, and so I feel this very intimate connection with the people in the choir, although most of them I've never actually met in person. Isn't that something? Well, I, I want to get to all your background here, but I want to continue on this, this virtual choir project because I mean, four or five million some odd people have looked at this thing on YouTube and it's, it's, it's outstanding, it's gotten great response. How, how did it come about? So a friend of mine sent me an email and he said, you've got to see this video. And this young girl, 17-year-old Britlin Losey, 
from Long Island, New York, had uploaded a fan video to me. And you can see her, it's still on YouTube, you can see her, she's saying, hi, Mr. Whitaker, I'm a big fan. And she sang the soprano line to a choral piece that I'd written, a different choral piece than, than this one. And watching her video, singing it alone by herself, I was just, I was moved to tears, really. I, I thought it was just so beautiful and pure and innocent. And it occurred to me in that moment that if I could get, say, 50 people to all do what she was doing, sing their parts, soprano, alto, tenor, or bass, yeah. and sing it at the same tempo and in the same key, wherever they were in the world, we could take all the videos, cut them together, and it would make a choir. It makes such perfect sense, and yet it really hadn't been done before. How long did it take you to do this? And did you recruit people? How'd you find these folks? It was, so I just made, I had the idea and then immediately wrote on my, my blog, I, I wrote, OMG, OMG. <laughs> <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say. And, and I said, I've just got this idea. Let's, let's try this thing. And the first thing we had to figure out was how are we going to coordinate it? How, how do we get everyone to sing at the same time? And so um, I had to make this conductor's video in complete silence, just imagining the music in my head. And then I posted it and I didn't know what would happen. This first, this is just Virtual Choir 1, we've done four now. And for this first one, there were 12 different countries represented, yes. 185 singers. And for this first one, there was this young man named Scott Haynes, 22 years old, who cut it all together himself, spent about three months working around the clock, editing and, and making sure that everything was just perfect. Were you surprised when it was done? I mean, you've worked with choirs, you've worked with the, the cream of the crop as far as professional singing groups, and yet when, you, when it was all put together, these voices from all over the world, were you surprised at what you heard? Astonished. I, what I couldn't, which I, what I still can't believe listening to it, is how musical it is. Yes. You know, you, you actually, everyone's breathing together and moving, and, and all of that I attribute to two things. One, they were really following my conductor track. So, so every time I asked for a crescendo, they would crescendo or decrescendo. That, that part's amazing. And then the second is that there's just, I feel you can, you can sense the, the, the spirit of the project in, in the people's videos, in their voices. Somehow they bring this, this desire to be part of something larger than themselves. And, and somehow that magic is infused in the videos. And to compare that now with, and you've, again, worked with some top choirs, what makes a good choir? Because we've all heard like the Hilliard Ensemble and we've heard the Talis Scholars and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and, and some of it's technically perfect. Some of it almost seems a little cold because it is so technically perfect. What makes a good choir? Well, for me, it's, it's a combination of those. It's great to have, have a, a technically uh, terrific group. There's no question. Singing with, with pure, clean vowels, and, and a lot of breath and support and an open sound and then singing together as an ensemble so that they're, they're feeling what each other is doing. But then on top of that, with, with the choral art form, there's text. We're singing words and sometimes they're in English, sometimes they're in Latin, different languages, but whatever it is, the best choirs to me are those that are telling a story with the words that, that take it from just being this technical exercise, music making, yes. to poetry. Yeah. Oh, it's just fantastic. I got to say, you're a child of the West. You were born in Nevada, went to UNLV. That's right. When the basketball team was pretty good, as yeah, I understand that's right, correctly. And, and how did you get from, really, a, a kid born in the West? I think you were kind of interested in pop music when you were younger. Yeah, only pop music. Only, what, I, what happened? What hit you? I got, I got lucky. I, I didn't read music. I really knew nothing about classical music. Um, and when I was 18, I, I played in pop bands my, through high school. I decided to... Uh, I went to UNLV just because it was the biggest state school sure. and the farthest from my parents, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, a friend of mine said, you've got to join choir. And so I joined just because there were cute girls in there and we were taking this trip to Mexico at the end of the year. And that first rehearsal, we, we started rehearsing the Requiem by Mozart. Oh. And it, I was transformed in, in that moment. Just it was, was, it, was it one of those ceiling drops and uh, could you see changes? Yeah. You could just feel it happening. I, I, could, I felt like my entire life I'd been seen in black and white and suddenly the world was in shocking technicolor. And you went from that to concentrating not so much on the singing anymore but to the composing. Yes. Why? At first I thought I wanted to be a conductor. I was watching this conductor, David Weiler at the university, he's still there and he was my hero. And then one day he casually said, um, we, we were having a note question about a piece written by a composer who's alive now, Kirk Meacham. And he said, you know, I think I'll call Kirk and ask him what he meant by this. And somehow it struck me that there was someone higher in the food chain <laughs> than, than the conductor. And I thought, wait, you can, you can do this and you can make a living? Being a, I, I, it, was, it just seemed impossible to me. And so I wrote a little piece and gave it to him as a gift to this conductor, to David Weiler. And that piece was published and then I wrote another and that piece was published. 
and I ended up uh, doing my master's degree at the Juilliard School. And it just, it, it took me, that single rehearsal took me in a direction I never could have imagined. Isn't that interesting how certain things can move you in certain ways? When you write, even now when you write, um, do you hear it when you're writing? Do you have to play it first? Do you hear a melody first and chase it? Or do you sit down and say, I'm waiting for you, Muse. Come and get me. Yeah, uh, Maurice Ravel, you know, the great impressionist yes. composer, has this terrific quote. He says, I will be at my writing desk from 8 to 4. If inspiration wants me, she knows where to find me. And that's something. And that's, that's how it feels, is that um, I, I usually start at the piano and I'll, I'll improvise, just it, trying to find a, a, a palette of colors, maybe a chord or a language that I know is my way into this, this new world. And then eventually I'll stumble on either a chord or just a little fragment. Sometimes the fragment comes when I'm walking around the city or I'm, I'm singing to myself in the shower. Sure. And, and it's this, this golden brick. I know I've got this brick that I can then construct an entire piece out of. And then as soon as I've got that, I try to go away from the, pia the piano and sit at the writing desk and just to hear it in my mind. I'll check every now and then just to see if it's sounding the way I'm hoping it will, but I try to do everything. Do you know it's going to be a choral piece or a wind piece? Do you know it's going to be part of a musical, maybe a film score? Does it announce what it's going to be, or do you kind of have to flesh it out a little it's bit? It's a good question. Um, no, I don't, I don't always yeah. know. And um, yeah, sometimes I can be quite surprised by, by the direction it goes. So we'll talk about the difference between writing choral music, classical music, if you will, um, musicals, film scores. Is there a different angle, a different direction you go? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It, classical music, there's a, I, I, don't, I don't subscribe to the theory that classical music is better or, or mm -hmm. more sophisticated. I, I find there's pop music or musical theater or opera or film scores that are just as artistically valuable as anything in the classical repertoire. But there is something in the classical world where things are just slightly formalized. And so I find when I'm writing classical music as, as opposed to other genres, I, I'm, I'm I'm just more cognizant of the, the sense of formality. And by formality, I mean the, the deep inherent structure in just the music itself, mm -hmm. so that it can stand on its own without anything else. Uh, you know, all those other genres really, they've got a visual component to it or a dance or with, with classical music, ideally the music is perfect, just the notes on the page. Something as, simil uh, as simple as a, a comic uh, piece in a classical piece would be far different than a comic stretch or a comic moment maybe in a musical, correct? Yeah, completely, yeah. absolutely. And it's all, it's all about context. Uh, I've, I've tried to write f comic pieces actually. Yeah? Classical, yeah, and I, I mean the, the best way in is to sort of make fun of the, of, of the, the context of the formality of the sure. moment, you know what I mean? And, and so if you, you, you can get big laughs by just pushing that a, oh, a little sure. bit. Yeah, it's, sure. it's an easier audience in some ways than, than a musical theater crowd. Well, with that in mind, talk about classical music. And you mentioned that it doesn't have to be difficult and it doesn't have to be formal. And yet, for most it is. And for a long time, whether it's serialism or 12-tone this, that, and the other, the atonal kind of revolution that defined modern music, modern classical music, for so long, did that help or hurt the art form, do you think? Hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, I think... <clears throat> In, this is a, a huge generalization, Yes. but 12-tone and atonal music, uh, especially the kind that was embraced, say, from 1930 to 1975, let's say, or 1980, did massive damage on, on most general classical music audiences. I think it really scared people away. And now when people hear contemporary music is going to be perform performed at a classical concert, I think rightly so, there's a bit of fear there. Mm -hmm. this, this was some thorny music they were making. I'm, I'm personally not really a fan of all of it, but again, it's a huge generalization because some of it is just beautiful and human and heartbreaking. So when you're composing, <coughs> do you find that if, when you do something, oh, oh, this might be a little, a little difficult, oh, this might be a little cliche, I mean, how do you work that out? And are you composing for anyone in particular? <laughs> Such a good question. Um, I. For me, I, I feel like every piece needs to have the primer, the set of rules built into the piece mm -hmm. itself. So that all, all the rules of this little world, you don't have to know anything about classical music or even this tonality as long as I, I start by saying, okay, this equals A, this equals B, A plus B equals C, right. come with me. And, and so as long as all of that is taken, taken care of, then I, I find you can really push audiences in terms of what they can handle with dissonance and, and rhythm 
as long as they're being invited and brought along in the piece. As long as you're not having more fun than they are, in other words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. And, and something happened where, in this last century, composers sometimes became incredibly introspective. And uh, Milton Babbitt wrote this very famous essay called Who Cares If Anyone Listens? Who Cares About the Audience? I don't remember what mm -hmm. it is. But, yeah, yeah. but basically the idea is, um, you know, who. who who cares about the audience? It's we're doing it for ourselves. And that's the antithesis of what I believe, which is that I'm, I'm really writing for people. I want to communicate. I, I want to reach out and touch people who are listening. Are you ever surprised that something that you wrote that you thought this is gold doesn't necessarily hit the marks you thought and something else that may have come quickly and you just kind of discarded it all of a sudden is a huge hit? Endlessly. And yeah. it happens all the time. There's a, a piece that I wrote fairly early on. It's called Water Night with a text by the Mexican poet Octavio Paz. And most of my pieces take weeks and weeks, if not months, to write. I really agonize over it. I'm a slow composer. And Water Night took me about 45 minutes. I just wrote it. It just happened. And it's, it's one of my, my most successful pieces. And I, I never could have even, I, I still don't know where it even came from. Isn't that interesting? Because some folks would say, I, I know some artists would say, if it comes too easy, they back off a little bit. Like, they, it, it's got, something's got to be wrong. This is too easy. Which is, which is the wrong way to, to feel, yeah. right? And most artists I know say the same thing, and then we all fight that thing. We, we, fight, we actually know that somehow when you can just find the, when, when you find the groove and everything is clicking, actually it, the effortlessness, you know then, oh my God, this is the path. And it feels effortless. It feels sometimes like, like I don't know, with me, I, I feel like in order to do a day's work, I've got to struggle, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or yeah. at least be tired by the end of it. So I think sometimes I, um, I work too hard and when I don't need to. Well, interesting. We've got about 30 seconds left now. You're going to be speaking to some students here later on this evening. What are you going to tell them? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I'm going to tell them to follow their dreams. You know, especially in the arts these days, it's so many of their parents, everybody's going to tell them it's a bad idea to, to do what they're doing. These are music students. And it, it, my own personal experience that be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. Well, you have done a remarkable amount of work. I mean, congratulations on your success. It's Thank beautiful, you. beautiful Thank music, you. and it's so good to have you here. Thanks for joining it's us. It's my honor. Thank you. Thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.